In the past three lectures, we focused on the diffusion of reactants towards the outside of a catalyst particle, right? And, and we've only really focused on these dense spheres, right? Where there's some boundary layer thickness, and then you're limited by the mass transport or the diffusion of reactants inside of this boundary layer, right? And this really is, you know, what we've called external diffusion. However, most real catalysts are not hard spheres. They have porosity. And that porosity is also used, or at least the surface inside of that porosity is also used to facilitate the reaction. And so if you want to think about what that might look like, here's a really good example, right? Where you have the white here is, is pore volume and the black here is the physical uh, catalyst, right? The dense part of the catalyst. However, what you might imagine is that you would not only now have external diffusion, but you would have internal diffusion, right? If you had a catalyst site that was located here, well, how do you get to it? Because you know that everything that we learned in the previous lectures about external diffusion applies. So even getting to this particle still occurs by diffusion, just from the outside of the boundary layer to the surface of of the catalyst. But now to get through the catalyst, um, we're going to have to think a little bit about how, um, how this happens, right? And the other limitation here, when we start to think about this constrained mass transport during internal diffusion, the geometry itself makes it difficult to explicitly treat the catalyst surface, which we were able to do for ex external diffusion. And what I mean by that is, when we have hard spheres, we know what all the properties are, right? We know what the surface area is, for example, et cetera. And there are very easy ways for us to think about this. But in, in this example on the left, right, we know that we have Fickian diffusion that describes the behavior. And this external diffusion, if we just think about this from the bulk to the surface, right, it occurs in a straight line, right? You have this Fickian random walk action, and it just happens in a straight line from the outside of the particle to the surface. But now that's certainly not true, right? When we have internal mass transport, right, or this internal diffusion, it's still Fickian, right? We still have this random walk aspect to it. But now, how do we access the catalyst? Well, if you wanted to think about this, we have a more complicated pathway to get to these interior active sites, right? So we could come to the surface and then you might get to a site here through that pathway, right? You could also be diffusing in here, right? And you could have to get to a site maybe this way. Again, you could come in, maybe you get to a site this way. And you'll notice all of these are not straight lines, right? That the pathway that you have to take now to get from the outside of the particle to the actual place where the reaction is going to happen inside the particle is windy. Or maybe a slightly more professional word for that is that it's tortuous. And so we're gonna define this property, this tau with a line over it. And I know we've used tau for residence time, which is why we have this line. Um, we're gonna call this the tortuosity. And the tortuosity is the actual difference between two points divided by the shortest distance between the two points. So let's just write actual distance divided by the shortest distance. And of course, the shortest distance is a straight line. Okay. And so you would say that the pathways to get from the outside of the particle to the active sites are, um, are tortuous. Something else to consider here too is that the pores are not, are not the same. They have changing diameters. So that is called constriction. And that's given the symbol sigma sub C, and that is our constriction factor. And what that does is it takes into consideration the fact that you can have either straight pores, 
where the constriction factor would be one, you could have um, pores that were more irregular like this, and there would be a constriction here, okay? The other thing that we have to consider as well is that not all the volume is available for reactant transport, right? We already said that we had areas in white here where it's free volume or void space, and that's where the fluid can move. Or you have um, the black in this figure where you have solid, okay? So we have to take all of that stuff into consideration and somehow link it to the diffusion, right? Because we said the mass transport inside of this particle is driven by diffusion. And normally when we talk about diffusion, we talk about the diffusivity, right? We just have DAB. But the actual effective diffusivity, this thing that we're going to call D sub E, right, is the effective diffusivity. And that is going to be the, the diffusivity that you measure in an experiment modified by these three effects that we just talked about. And the first one is that you multiply the diffusivity by the porosity. And it probably makes sense that you do that because um, you, you actually reduce the space that's available, right? And the porosity is always gonna be less than one. Then we also multiply by this constriction factor and then you divide by the tortuosity. And it should make sense, I think, especially to divide by the tortuosity because the more tortuous the path, right? The longer the path length it takes, that would mean um, the lower effective diffusivity that you have inside of, of the system, okay? So this brings us, I think, to an, a fairly obvious question then. How does this actually relate directly to the flux? And then of course the flux and the reaction rate are linked to each other. So we're gonna answer that question by doing something very similar to what we did for external diffusion. Remember, we drew the particle, the solid particle, and then we drew the boundary layer and we asked ourselves what would happen to the mass transport inside of the boundary layer on the outside of the particle. Well, here, what we're going to do is we're gonna bring back this diagram for our particle with internal diffusion. And now we're gonna consider cross sections inside of our particle, okay? So we're gonna take two of these. So the first one is going to be, uh, we're just gonna call this um, R star, right? And so we'll try to center that right in the middle of this particle. So this has a radius from the center to here of something that we'll, like I said, we'll call this R star. We also, we'll take a second one that is a little bit larger and I'll, I'll make it maybe larger than the differential volume that we hope that it is. Actually, you know what? That one's not quite large enough. Let me try that again. All right, let me go to, like that. And that, <laughs> sorry, that didn't end up being a circle. All oh, the wonders of doing this live. There we go. All right, so that one, and maybe is a little bit bigger than I wanted it to be, but that's fine. So we're gonna take this second section here, and we're gonna say that that actually occurs at a radius that we're gonna call R star plus delta R, okay? And then the last measurement that we're gonna consider here is the total radius of our particle, and we're just gonna call that capital R, okay? And now let's consider the mass balance for some species A, right? Let's say that we have our normal reaction where A is just going to be. And let's consider the mass balance for A as we move from the center towards the catalyst surface, right? Or as we're moving, let's say from R star to R star plus delta R. And our mass balance, of course, is still just in minus out plus generation minus consumption, of course, equals accumulation. And we're operating these flow reactors at steady state. So that's going to go to zero. And what we're left with then is the flow of A at R star minus the flow of A at 
R star plus delta R plus our reaction rate, right? So this is, uh, if we treat this as a single reactor inside of this particle, right? This is just Ra times the volume of our sphere or the, or the volume of um, this shell or whatever you wanna call it is equal to zero, okay? So now what we wanna do then is relate this similarly to what we did for external diffusion and bring in the flux. And if you remember this, the flux of A times the cross-sectional area was, uh, was equal to the flow rate. And so this is just the flux of A in the R direction times the area of the, sh of the shell that we're at, at R star minus the flux of A times the cross-sectional area at R star plus delta R, then plus Ra times the volume of the solid. And we're gonna say that that's equal to zero, right? From the mass balance. Now, the next thing I wanna pick on is Ra a little bit. So this reaction rate of A is the bulk reaction rate constant, but that's not really the thing that's the most important here, right? The thing that's the most important here is the aerial rate. And we need to transition from Ra to this Ra double prime that we've been talking about here. And in this case, so Ra is Ra double prime and times rho B times the surface area, okay? And the only other thing we're going to do with this is we're also, right, this is the density uh, or the almost the, the packing factor, right? But this is also related to other properties. So it's not quite rho B because we actually have porosity, right, that we have to consider. times the surface area. And this thing is a slight modification of what we've done before, but this we're just gonna call rho C. That's just the density of the catalyst particle itself. And so we're gonna say that Ra then is this Ra double prime times rho C times the surface area. And if we put all of that in our equation that we had above, you know, what we're gonna find is that the flux of A in the R direction times the cross-sectional area at R star minus the flux times the cross-sectional area at R star plus delta R equals Ra double prime times rho C times the surface area times the volume of the solid, right? Or not equals, I apologize, right? That's just plus and that's equal to zero, okay? All right. So now what in the world are we gonna do from here? Well, we're going to make, um, we're gonna end up having to make this assumption here that delta R is small, okay? Remember, we're gonna, we're gonna try to get to a derivative just like we've done in the past. And to do that, we have to assume small values for, um, for the change in the radius. And that's gonna have a couple of interesting effects here. So, the first one is that we now can estimate the volume or the volume change of the solid, right? As we move from here out to here, actually it's from here to here, right? We're gonna have to take that volume into consideration. So that's the first thing that we're gonna do. And we're gonna say the volume or the effective volume in this problem is equal to the area of a sphere, which is four pi times the radius squared. And we're gonna pick the mean radius between the two of them times delta R, right? That's just area times length. We also know that the cross-sectional area here and here are both equal to four pi times R squared, right? And we'll call that RI because the radius is gonna change a little bit. 
And so if we make those two substitutions, we get that the flux of A in the aerial direction times the cross-sectional area. So that just becomes four times pi times R squared at R star minus the flux in the R direction times four times pi times R squared at R star plus delta R is then, um, then plus R A double prime times rho C times our surface area, then times four pi times this mean squared delta R is equal to zero, right? And this is a fairly complicated result so far, but we're, we're looking at really the flux versus the reaction rate here. And we're able then to cancel out these four pi's, right? Those are gonna go away. And we're also able then to take the limit as delta R um, goes to zero. And the effect of that is that this delta R becomes just dr, right? It's a differential volume. And the other thing that happens is just this mean radius is approximately the same, right? It, it essentially doesn't change. And that just becomes equal to R squared. And that's important for what we're going to do here, because now all of a sudden um, we have a differential form for this and that we have minus this D W A R times R squared dr plus R A double prime times the surface area times rho C times R squared is equal to zero. Okay. We also already said that our internal diffusion, just like the external diffusion, is Fickian. And remember, Fick's law says that flux is equal to the diffusivity or minus the diffusivity times dCa dr. And the question here then is what diffusivity are we talking about? And in this case, remember a couple of minutes ago, we talked about how the, the diffusivity is manipulated by the tortuosity, porosity, et cetera. So this is our effective diffusivity. So we're going to put that in this equation and we get minus D of negative DE times DCA DR times R squared DR plus RA double prime times SA rho C R squared is equal to zero. Okay. So we also know that RA double prime is equal to minus K times um, CA raised to its stoichiometric coefficient. So I'm, we're going to call this KN times CA raised to the N power. And here N, we're going to try to track the reaction order here. And we don't use alpha because we're gonna to get to a point where um, we have a variable that's defined with N um, in its subscript. And we wanna make sure that we track what we're doing here. So now we have this and we can substitute this into, um, into our equation above. And we have minus D of negative DE DCA DR times R squared dr is equal to r squared times, oops, not equals, I'm sorry, I keep doing that. It's plus, and then we have the negative from the reaction right there, minus r squared times this kn times sa times rho c times ca to the n. 
And so we don't have to carry all of these around. We're just gonna call this KN star, okay? And simplify our life just a little bit. And if we do that and divide by minus one, we get an expression where we get D of minus DE DCA DR times R squared DR plus R squared, oh, that two's a little far away, sorry, times KN star times CA to the N is equal to zero, okay? So why did we do this? Well, we did this so we can get an expanded form of an equation that has a known solution to it. Okay, at least for certain cases, we're gonna be able to say that. So if we expand this derivative, or maybe the first thing I'll do is I'll move the negative over so this isn't um, confusing. There we go, r squared kn star ca to the n is equal to zero. So now I'm just going to expand this using the product rule. And if we do that, right, we get, this is de times r squared times d c a d squared c a d r squared plus two r times d c a d r minus r squared k n star c a to the n is equal to zero, and then I'm going to divide through by r squared times d e. And if we do that, we get d squared ca dr squared plus two over r times dca dr minus kn star ca to the n over de is equal to zero, okay? And believe it or not, this is what we were after. And the reason that we, we're chasing this was because this is going to give us our concentration gradient inside of the particle, okay? And to solve this, we need two boundary conditions, okay? And those two boundary conditions, I think, are, um, are somewhat straightforward. So our first boundary condition is just at R equal to the radius, right? The overall radius of our particle the concentration of A is equal to the surface concentration. And remember, it's not the bulk because everything that we've done so far with external diffusion still applies, right? If you have external diffusion to the particle, uh, it's still completely possible. And in fact, likely that the concentration at the surface is less than the bulk concentration. So we're referencing relative to that where you've taken internal diffusion or sorry, external diffusion into consideration. And that at our initial radius, we're just going to say that CA has a finite value. That's just getting us to a functional form where at zero, you can't get like negative infinity as an answer. Okay. And so I'm not going to rigorously solve this. Um, if you're interested in all the little details inside of Fogler's book, um, you know, pages 726 to 727 will do that. But I want us to do maybe what I think is the most important part of the, of the next set of the derivation, because it allows us to define a property that's going to be very simple and allow us to get a, a, a feeling very quickly for what is controlling the reaction in the particle. Is it kinetics or is it mass transport? And to do that, we have to define two dimensionless variables. So this is C, and we're gonna define that as CA over uh, CA at the surface. 
And we're also going to define lambda, which is just r, right, where we are in the particle over the radius. And if we do that, I'm not going to make um, all the substitutions one at a time. I'll just give you the result because um, we're actually getting to the, the point that we want to make here. And this just becomes d squared c, d lambda squared, plus 2 over lambda times d c d lambda minus k n star times r squared times c a s, right? The concentration at the surface to the n minus 1 times c to the n power over DE, and that's equal to zero, okay? So why is this important? And what's gonna help us to solve this problem and maybe to understand physically what's happening after all this math? So we're gonna cherry pick this term here. And we're gonna define this as theta n squared. And we are gonna call this the Thiele modulus. And actually it's a capital because it's somebody's name. So we're gonna call this the Thiele modulus, okay? And just for clarity here, that is squared and that's Kn star times R squared times Cas to the N minus one, right? Where N is the reaction order divided by DE. And the question then becomes, what does the Thiele modulus actually tell us? And why is that important? So there's the functional form. We will use that to calculate it. But I'm gonna do a little bit of a transformation here for the right-hand side of this equation. And I'm just gonna mess with this N minus one a little bit and the Rs. So this, if I do that, I'm gonna write this as Kn star times R times the concentration of A at the surface, divided by the effective diffusivity times Cas, right? And that's actually Cas to the N over R. All right, why did I do that? So the thing I wanna, show you is this first. This is like CAS times a diffusivity over a length. And remember, we had this before where we had an expression in external diffusion where we had something like DAB over the diffusion layer thickness, right? And so this denominator is actually a corollary for the diffusion, right? It's like the rate of the diffusion into the particle. Okay. And the numerator is basically Kn times Ca at the surface. That is the surface reaction. At, well, it's the rate of the surface reaction or the rate of reaction at the surface. And so the Thiele modulus is basically a measure of the rate of reaction over the rate of diffusion. And we've talked in previous lectures about whether you're uh, kinetically controlled or mass transport controlled. And this will, the Thiele modulus itself can tell you whether you're internal diffusion limited or either reaction limited or external diffusion limited, okay? So if you think about it this way in terms of a ratio, when the Thiele modulus is large, that means that the rate of reaction at the surface is larger than, is, is much higher than the diffusion coefficient. So that would mean when you have a large Thiele modulus, that internal diffusion is limiting, right? 
the reaction, right? And conversely, when that is small, you either have um, the surface reaction limiting, at least related to internal diffusion, or you have external diffusion, right? Because that, that still will limit the reaction rate on the, on the surface, okay? So we have this equation above, this one. And for a first order reaction, we have certain boundary conditions. And you know, if we have, again, A goes to B, our equation simplifies actually kind of nicely. Right. If you look at this above, and here, let me just zoom out a little bit here. Right. First order, A goes to B. Well, we would simply rewrite this as, you know, D squared C D lambda plus two over lambda times D C D lambda minus phi one squared, right, or the Thiele coefficient of this first order reaction times C is equal to zero. And for this case where you have a first, where you have the first order reaction, we actually know the solution to this. So C, which again is CA over CAS is equal to one over Lambda times the hyperbolic sine function of Lambda times the square root of the Thiele modulus divided by the hyperbolic sine of just the square root of the Thiele modulus. And there's no square root here, remember, because the Thiele modulus is defined as being that squared value, okay? And here that Thiele modulus would be equal to, if we just went to calculate it, right? We had this definition here where it was Kn star times R squared times CAS to the N minus one. Well, N minus one, if it were first order would just be um, zero. So CAS to the zero is equal to one. And so for a first order reaction, the Thiele modulus is K1 times the radius of the particle squared divided by the effective diffusivity, right? Um, and then of course the value that would go in here in the solution is the square root of that. We are gonna get some practice in using this and using the Thiele modulus as we move, as we move forward. But the thing that I wanted to use this um, to point out is that you know, we could actually plot this for a first order reaction. And I think that plotting this is much more instructive than it is to do a lot more math. And I know that's maybe semi-hypocritical because we did a ton of math to get here. But you know, one of the things that we wanna try to do here is now visualize what happens, right? When are we external? or surface limited, or when are we internal mass transport limited? And what would that actually mean in our system, okay? And let's then look at this as bound by these lambdas. And remember lambda was the radius or where you are relative to the outer radius. So R equal to zero is Maybe I'll write that here. So R equal to zero is the center of the particle and R equal to one is the surface. And then we have C, which was the concentration of A over the surface concentration. Now, for all of these at the surface, you're just equal to the surface concentration, right? And of course, this is also bound by one. So for every plot I could imagine, right, we would end up here where I just drew this dot, right? You're always at the surface concentration when you're at the surface. I know that sounds ridiculous, but uh, to say out loud, but you know, just to make sure we're all on the same page. So let's think about this for a second. And I'm gonna ask you guys the question. Let's think of the case where the Thiele modulus is very small, right? We're gonna say this is very small. Okay. Now remember, we define the Thiele modulus as the as the kinetic rate 
over the mass transport rate, right? So if the Thiele modulus is very small, that actually means that kinetics dominates, that mass transport is pretty fast. So what do you think the concentration profile looks like here if mass transport isn't the controlling factor? maybe a visual aid would be good. So let's bring this back up and then we'll revisit, okay? So let's look at this, right? So we're trying to get here, right? We have everything trying to come in here. If diffusion, let's say was infinitely fast, what would the difference be in the concentration at this point and the concentration at this point? If, mass if diffusion was infinitely fast, I'm guessing no difference. Yeah, they would be exactly the same. And this is this is what we are trying to get at with the Thiele modulus being small, right? Remember the Thiele modulus squared was basically the reaction rate over the mass transport rate. And so if the mass transport rate were infinitely, infinitely fast, right? That would be zero, right? It would be a very small value. And so, when we scroll back up to here then, that means that if the Thiele modulus is very, very small, this would be flat. And the important thing here is that uh, internal mass transfer does not limit the reaction, right? All right, let's do another extreme. So let's do our Thiele modulus is very large, like very large, okay? So if that's the case, I mean, just looking here at this equation that I wrote, that would mean that the reaction rate is much larger than mass transport or mass transport is very slow. So let's say it was infinitely slow right, that you couldn't get any material into the particle. What would the concentration, if you let this thing go to steady state, what would the concentration in the middle be? Like at the very center of the particle, if, it, if this were not possible. So zero? Yeah, it'd be zero because you would essentially consume everything that's on the inside of the particle. And then you would be stuck with no ability to get anything inside of the particle. And this can happen with small pores, highly tortuous systems, very poor diffusivity. Um, and that goes here, right? So we know everything has to start here. And if the Thiele modulus is extremely large, I mean, it can, I mean, we can, we can get to zero very quickly. Maybe that's a very poor way to draw zero quickly, but we can, we're here where the surface concentration is zero. And there are other, things that we could think about, right? So we'll do a couple of these in different greens, but it's plausible that the concentration at the middle could still be zero, right? And you could still do this, right? And this would be a more effective use of the catalyst, but not completely effective. Um, if I take another green here, you know, you also could have this, right? You also could have that. And each of these greens, as I move this way with the arrow, is increasing effectiveness with regards to how you're utilizing the interior pore volume. And we're going to end up in subsequent lectures defining something where we use the Thiele modulus to get to a thing called the effectiveness factor. And we're going to look at an internal effectiveness factor we're gonna look at an external effectiveness factor and then an overall effectiveness factor. And that's the thing that's gonna allow us to know doing a few calculations. Are we internal mass transport limited? Are we external mass transport limited? Or are we kinetically limited? And that's where the things that we've been doing over the last several lectures really come together. And it tells you how complicated 
your solution is going to have to be, right? Where do we, where do we end? And then what is the functional form that we're going to have to use when we're solving examples in class? But if you were to actually do this for a real catalytic system later in the future.